we sold every one of those kids made over a thousand dollars in forty five minutes. We wow. made oh, it was hilarious. <laughs> like every house we went to bought it, and they're just looking at me like this guy's a magician. <laughs> If you're looking to leave the 9 to 5 and to elevate your side hustle, the Hustle the Day podcast is the podcast for you. Your host, Trent Bray, left the 9 to 5 grind behind and is helping others do the same and focus on the future. Hear from others who have done it and how they did it. Jump in as we talk entrepreneurship, mindset, and strategy. Just take it one day at a time and hustle the day. On this episode of the Hustle the Day podcast, I am honored to have Jimmy Rex on the show. Jimmy is a realtor, an investor, an author, a podcaster, and the creator of the $100 Dinner Movement. Super crazy, awesome stories. You've got to check out this episode and make sure to listen to the end for details on how to win a copy of Jimmy's book. Let's get into it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Hustle of the Day podcast. My name is Trent. Super excited and honored to be sitting across from Jimmy Rex. Jimmy, why don't you jump in? Tell my audience a little bit about yourself. What's up, Trent? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. I just uh, I'm a real estate guy. That's kind of the main thing that I'm known for, I think, and I've uh, been doing it for 17 years now. Uh, so helped a lot of people buy and sell homes and done a lot of investing myself. And it's led to kind of a fun, adventurous life. So I guess that's uh, <laughs> the best way I can put it. Yeah, definitely. You are living the adventurous life. But for those people that might not be familiar with your story, I know I know a lot of people are, but can you take us back to kind of where this entrepreneurial venture all started? You know, your famous selling meat story. <laughs> selling meat. Yeah, no. So when I uh, when I was 21 years old, I was kind of looking for a job. I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do next. I actually wanted to be a waiter, but um, back then I didn't want to work on Sundays for you know religious purposes. And so nobody would hire me. And so I ended up answering this ad in the newspaper to sell steak and chicken door to door. And it was pretty funny. I went down there and interviewed for the job and they explained that like basically you buy the case of meat um, like my cost on it was like $103 per case and anything over that I got to keep. And I went out the first day to train and like these guys that were trainers, they were showing me that with average sell, you're probably selling this case for about 150 bucks. And so I was like, man, that's, you know, this could be pretty good. If I can sell three or four or five, six a day, that's like 300 bucks a day. And so I remember when I told my mom, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to sell meat order. I'm going to make 300 bucks a day. And I was like 21 and she's, she's like, well, if you make that much a day, you know, I'll quit my job and whatever. And uh, I went out my first day. It was kind of cool. It was a cool moment because in your life, when you're a kid, you always want to have money when you're an adult, right? You want to be rich or whatever, but you don't really know how that's going to look or how that's going to come about. I remember that first day on the door, they, uh, they gave me my freezer, put it back in my truck and I got like six cases of meat and, uh, and they told me, you know, I was like, well, if I sell all this, what do I do? They're like, we'll just call us. We'll bring you some more. And so I go out and I'm just hustling. I'm just slinging this stuff. And about an hour and a half, I sold all six cases, made about 280 bucks. And I remember I called up the bosses and I'm like, hey, like I'm ready for some more meat. And they're like, uh, we didn't think you'd actually sell it all. We're in Provo, like an hour away. And they're like, just go home for the day, I guess. I'm like, okay. So I went home and it, my, that forever changed my life though, because in that moment, I realized my worst case scenario in life is I was going to be able to make $100,000 a year selling meat. And it kind of blew my world up. I'm like, man, and just my mind immediately expanded. Like, I can do whatever I want. And anyway, long story short, I did that for about five months. I was making about three, 400 bucks a day. But I realized the bosses made this mistake. They did a bonus structure one day. They said, okay, if you sell over 10 cases, then I think it's like 80 bucks a case you get them for instead of 103. And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, like, well, they're not going to lose money on that deal. So they're getting them for under 80 bucks a case. And so I went home that day. Because I was like the only one selling any meat out of all the sales guys. And they seemed to be doing fine as a business. So I'm like, I don't know. How much are they making off me? So I went home and I Googled the box and found the supplier. It was out in Chicago. And I was like pretending I wanted to open a meat business in Utah. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's uh, $58 a case. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I was selling like 10 to 15 cases a day. So these guys were making some freaking serious coin on me. you know. And I was just like, this is bullshit. And... Uh, so I went the next day. I had one boss I hated. The other one I really, really liked the guy. His name was Herman. I said, hey, Herman, I know you guys get the cases for 58 bucks a case. I'm going to start my own meat business and rival against you. Or you can – I said, I'm either – I'm leaving either way. I'll pay $1,000 to teach me anything I don't know and if it's worth it. you know." And he goes, how about this? Let's partner instead. He goes, by the way, the cases aren't 58. I can get them for 53 or something like that. <laughs> so I was like, all right. 
And so we ended up starting this meat business. And uh, I was just a young hustler, man. I was trying so hard. I wanted to be retired by 30. I had all these big dreams and goals. And it was funny. So we'd go out every day. And between Herman and I, I mean, we could make 2000 bucks a day selling meat door to door. We were really good at it. And uh, we were making all these sales. And we were getting all these sales guys. And uh, like well, nobody was doing the accounting. Nobody was doing the bug. I mean, we were terrible at all that stuff. Like, like being honest, I think it's been past the statute of limitations. <laughs> but like, we didn't even collect sales tax for the first like few months. Like, it was terrible. Like, I don't even want to know how much you know money we would have to pay for that. But we just didn't know what we were doing really. But we were hustling and we were building this thing. And we decided we we're gonna franchise it. And so, and Herman just he was a huge thing. Like this guy was such a character. And in life, I love characters. I love people. Like you can't find this person. Like this guy was six five. He's from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam, and uh, had no front teeth. Dude would literally start every day. We would uh, go to the gas station. He'd get a freaking big old thing of orange juice, like the huge one that you share with your whole family normally. And then he'd get like those uh, like black licorice candies, yeah. like the ones from Europe, though. And the guy would just suck on that shit all day long. And uh, I remember like we'd go to the bagelry every morning, too, and get a bagel. Before we'd go out and every single day he'd get a, he'd ask for a water and he'd fill it up with Coke and then he'd turn around and yell across the restaurant and he had this accent. He'd be like, ma'am, your Coke, it's so dirty. And the whole place would laugh and then he'd drink the Coke and that's what he drank. But every single day he did the same thing. It was so funny and they just always, they knew it was coming and they still gave him the water cup. But anyway, dude was just a character and he'd been all around the world, done a million things. He's about 15 years older than me. What I didn't realize, because I was pretty naive this Mormon kid just hustling away at life. And uh, I'd never seen a drug in my life. I'd seen like a weed bud like one time at my buddy's house. And uh, this dude was on drugs and I didn't know that. And we ended up franchising the company. We, I remember at the time um, we had our franchise lawyer and we built, we bought this giant, well, we ended up partnering is what we did, like I said. And so we bought this where we rented out a warehouse, leased it for like three years bought this giant walk-in freezer, bought these huge trucks, bought vans. We wrapped it all to have, like be our, our company. It was called the Nebraska Meat Network. And we it was so funny. Like, we wrapped the van to look like cows, like, hanging their arms out the window and stuff. It was actually okay. pretty cool. Yeah. People loved it. Yeah. We did the whole thing, like, right. We bought the marketing materials and the shirts and everything. And we were going big with this thing. But um, we kept making sales, kept making sales. And, like, no money was coming in. My bank account was empty. I'd poured all my money into the business. I'd gotten loans with Mountain America for $60,000 for all this stuff. Um, I had uh, racked up credit cards. Herman was living in a rental property I owned. I was living in a house. I was paying both mortgages. And it was like every month I would just put like, okay, this much more is going to be owed to Jimmy kind of thing because we were just pouring everything back in. And um, this dude was, he was sharp, man. He was scamming me pretty good. But one day we, we franchised. We ended up getting this guy from Argentina. His name was Martin. I'll never forget and he came up to watch us one day. And what this dude, bless his heart, what he didn't understand was that me, Herman, there was another partner. He was like a minority partner named Talmadge. We're like three of the best salesmen you're ever going to meet. So this guy watched us go out one day. I think we cranked like 35 cases of meat. We're making 75, 80 bucks a case. This guy's just like, this is a gold mine. Right. And uh, the average sales guy would do like two or three. So it was like still, if you have enough sales guys, it works. But like he saw something he thought he was getting, you know. Something that it wasn't. We'll just say that. And anyway, he ends up paying Herman. They agreed a $50,000 to franchise it. He was going to be our St. George franchise. Well, Herman gets 35000 cash from this guy. It was like his life savings. Again, he would like migrated from Argentina. And Herman disappears for two weeks. And dude's just gone. I have no idea where he's at. Uh, me and Talmadge are driving all over town trying to find him, checking all of his favorite spots. He knew all these little hole-in-the-wall Indian places and, um, like, just weird restaurants that nobody else would know about, you know. And, like, we'd been to all those with him. And so we're checking them all and nothing, nothing. And his family is calling me, and they're, like, yelling, like, where's our dad? Like, nobody can find the guy. I didn't know he had a drug issue. And so what had happened is he shows up two weeks later wearing the same clothes he was when he left. And, um, and we both just start bawling. I'm like, what is going on? And... He's like, I'm sorry, I have a drug problem and our money's all gone. He went on a drug bench for two weeks, just a crazy, who knows what those parties were doing. But, and anyway, and then that moment, I was so like devastated by all, I just said, I can't deal with this. Um, it's one thing I've been really good at in my life is I don't, like, I have pretty strong boundaries. And so, like, I'll, you know, I'll let anybody 
like, I'll, if I love somebody, it's like, it's forever. But like, I'm good at like saying like, you know, if I don't want to do something, I'm not going to do it. And if you're not good for me, I'm going to cut you out. Like yeah. something I've always done. And I just said, look, man, I can't do this. Like we're done. You know, I'm shutting it down. And so I got stuck in that moment with, um, 120 grand debt. I remember calling all the people. I had to call the guy with the lease. I had to call the guy with the propane. I had to call the people that had fronted this, the meat. I told everyone, I'm like, look, I just got my real estate license a few months ago. I'm going to go sell some houses and pay you back. But I have no money. Here's what happened. My partner screwed me. I had to call Martin. I thought I was going to go to jail, dude, because we took this dude's money and there was nothing there for it. And I, thankfully he was like pretty humble about it and just wanted to, he could tell that I was a victim in this as well. Mm -hmm. And so I put a poster board, I made this poster board and I put it, I remember I was living in this house in Draper and I put it in the, uh, in the basement. I put it behind the clothes closet I wrote all the people that I had money that I owed to. It was like 120 grand total and how much it was. And every month, every single time I, not every month, every week, basically, every time I closed a deal, I'd pay a chunk of it towards these people I had this debt to. And one by one, I started paying them off. And it was actually like this huge gift. It was kind of cool because, um, by the way, like I worked with Herman for about a year and a half. And every single day was a treat to go to work, man. This guy was insane in all the best ways, all the worst ways. Taught me so many lessons about life. It was like a really expensive education. But the dude was a treat. I mean, we had so much fun selling me. I remember like we would be driving. Like he didn't know there was an old um, strip club downtown. It's called, what the hell is it called? Uh, where's your buddies when you need them? Um, there was, uh, what was it called? And it was like trails, but it was yeah. like whatever it was in Utah. A bush. It wasn't called American Bush or something. Anyway. And I'm like, oh, those guys about meet off me once we were driving. I'm like, go, 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 go. And because we kind of point to each other at the houses and you just run, you know, we're just hustling. And you remember he runs in. He's all excited. He's got a case of meat with him. <laughs> it's like 60 steaks. And he runs out and he walks out and he like kind of has this perplexed look on his face. And he's like, man, you... You sell me in there. That's a titty bar. <laughs> it was so fun. I was just dying laughing. We were just messing with each other all day. But so we really had a great time. And I just, it just broke my heart, man, because it was like, I really thought we had some, like this dude was coming to church with me. I thought I was going to baptize him and his family. I was so altruistic about everything. And I remember we had one guy, we went behind the warehouse one time. It was out in Midville in like the ghetto. And there's a homeless guy like behind the warehouse. Oh. And kind of scared me. I was trying to get something. I was like, oh, shit. And so I go back in. Herman again was like 6'5", you know. And we had this warehouse guy that would drive our trucks. He was a big old dude, too, big um, Polynesian dude. And Rick was his name. Great guy. But uh, they come back behind the warehouse. And we're like looking at this guy. And I don't know what to do, you know. And Herman just goes, hey, man, you want a job? It's January, by the way. It's freezing outside. And he looks up. He goes, sure. <laughs> and so we end up getting this dude. His name was uh, Dave. And we pulled Dave in. We got him. We even took like a before picture just for, I was so excited. I was like, we're going to change this guy's life. I know it. So we get him all, we took him to, uh, we got him one of those two week stay hotels, mm -hmm. like the in town suites or whatever for two weeks. We got him all of his clothes, all of his groceries. We got him, uh, went and got him a haircut. I remember. And then I took him to Tony Roma's for like his first meal, you know, like back on his feet. Yeah. And this dude goes out his first day. And I think he made like 250, 270 bucks or something. And we were so pumped. We're like, oh my gosh, Dave can sell. This is going to be the best. I'm like literally on cloud nine. I'm like, we took this homeless guy. We're going to change his life. This is going to be the best thing ever. Next day he goes out, makes, I think about 180 bucks, pretty good day. And uh, at the end of the day, he's like, hey guys, like I haven't, you know, um, had money for a while. Do you mind fronting me my pay for the first two days? We're like, yeah, no problem. So I pay this dude. And the third day, he doesn't show up. We're like, okay, like, whatever. Like, maybe he had errands to run. He finally had some money to go buy, you know, some things he wanted or whatever. Next day, he doesn't show up. I mean, Herman had a key to the hotel. We're like, well, we better go check on him. So we go over there. I remember we knock on the door, no answer. We knock on the door, no answer. Finally, Herman opens the door. And my poor eyeballs have never been tainted like this before. This guy had, like, had, like, his homeless girlfriend in the bed with him. Thankfully, they were just laying there. But... And the whole entire hotel room is just full of junk. This guy had been dumpster diving for two days straight and oh, bring wow. it all into the hotel room. And there was this giant burn mark on the middle of the carpet. We ended up having to pay like like $800 or something for this to fix it. But anyway, we're like, Dave, what's up, man? He's like, oh, guys, uh, yeah, thanks for everything. But like this just really isn't for me. And we're like, well, 
okay, but um, this isn't a vacation that we're giving you. Like, you know, like we gave you this stuff to use because we were trying to help you with a job. And he's like, well, yeah, it's just not, I just, I'm just better off being homeless, guys. And we're like, all right, well, you got till six to be out. He's like, but I thought you guys paid for two weeks. We're like, we did. You got till six. I remember Herman and I was just like so sad about it. It was like this, it was that first moment in life. And you're like, oh, life's just not going to be as like what you think it is sometimes, right. you know? And Herman, he's like, yeah, that was, I saw that coming from my way. But like shit like that we were doing, it was just so fun, man. And we just, all the time we were doing stuff. And anyway, long story short, um, yeah. So when he came back, uh, I just shut it down. I got stuck with all that debt and for the next 18 months, I paid it off. But that was the last time I ever saw Herman. The last time I ever sold me. And, uh, well, it wasn't the last time, but I did do it a few other times just to help. I actually, when I was coaching baseball at Bingham, um, I don't know, I'll just tell this real quick, but it was funny. So this is by, by the way, like things, inefficiency drives me insane. Like when I see something that isn't working, I'm like, that needs to be fixed. Like, this is inefficient. And so I started coaching at Bingham High School on the baseball team, 2009. And the coaches, like, there was three kids that really needed money for the year. I think you have to get, like, I don't know, like 800 bucks to play. Mm -hmm. And these three kids came from pretty poor backgrounds, and so they weren't able to pay it. And I was the coach is like, well, we're going to sell cookie dough. You make six bucks per carton or whatever. I'm like, what the hell, six bucks a carton? I'm like, coach, hold on how many things of cookie dough are they going to have to sell? Like, like hundreds, like to make any money? I'm like, no, no, no. If your uncle's going to buy cookie dough, he'll buy a case of meat. I said, let me take them out. I'm going to teach him how to slay meat door to door. And so I told the kids, I'm going to go put your uniforms on. I took them out in Coben. Oh, what the hell is the other two's name? I don't remember. Anyway, and we go out and Kyler was another one. And we went out, uh, uh, Brady was the third one. And we go out and we literally... In like 45 minutes, these, we'd knock on these doors, these rich people in South Georgia. We're like, hey, we're doing a fundraiser for Bingham Baseball. We have this case of meats, normally 400 bucks. We're selling it today for 200 uh, Try to help the team. We sold, every one of those kids made over $1,000 in 45 minutes. We wow. made, oh, it was hilarious. Like, every house we went to bought it. And they're just looking at me like, this guy's a magician. Like, so we go back the next day, and they've told everyone on the team, right? So right. all of a sudden, the coach is like, I got five more guys that need to go with you, actually. We go out, same thing, like an hour, 20 minutes, every one of them makes a thousand bucks. And uh, anyway, it was just hilarious. That was actually the last time I sold meat with them. But we didn't even have the meat with us. I just had like a paper that I'd made up. I knew I could order the meat in and get it. And so it was so funny, though. But I mean, it was good times, man. Like, I, I don't tell those stories. It's been a while since I told the whole meat story. But it really was the ultimate gift because when everything fell apart, I mean, I was backed into a corner that I did not know how I was going to get out of. 120 right. grand debt. Thankfully, I had my real estate license. And I just said, I'm coming out swinging. I worked 80, 90 hours a week to, because I just, I didn't, I thought no girl's ever going to want to date me. Like I'm, I have all this debt. I'm the poorest person I know. Like, I'm just like, it's going to take me a lifetime to pay off. And, you know, and I got it all paid off in about 18 months. And, and it was really what propelled my real estate career. That first year I ended up selling 60 homes because I needed to. Right. And so anyway, I just look at the whole thing and I, I mean, you can tell I have nothing but good vibes or a good feeling about it because it's just such a crazy time in my life. Yeah, absolutely. But it, that's great that it launched that, you know, real estate career. And you know what, there's a recurring theme that I've noticed in your story of perseverance and, you know, just, just keep on going on. And the way I actually was introduced to who you were was of, of course your viral video of the, the, uh, houseboat of sinking <laughs> nice. and then, you know, throttling it, even though it's going under, you managed to make the, make it back safely and get everybody loaded off and still manage to save the boat. Uh, which, uh, yeah, I just, I didn't have any choice, man. The boat was sinking and we were in the, we were in a Canyon. So I was like, there's nowhere to go. So I'm like, well, screw it. I'm just going to keep going forward. And so people just were just, when they watch the video, they just die laughing. It's got over 150 million views now, by the way. So you were the first one that was <laughs> the only one introduced me that way, but yeah. I didn't know what to do. And I, you know, actually learned a lesson from Herman that helped me on the houseboat. So it's, we'll tie it all together. But as the boat's sinking, like I kind of just was making jokes. I was keeping my cool. I'm like, all right. Like I was very smart. I got everybody, like you said, off the boat. I was making sure I was being responsible. But at the same time, I'm like thinking to myself, I'm like, well, I don't know what else to do. I'm just going to drive and see if I can make it. I think I can make it. Mm -hmm. And if not, at least I gave it my best effort, you know? And so right. I'm just full throttle forward trying to, and I mean, half the boat is in the water. It's flooding all over yeah. the place. And, um, and some of the other boat owners, cause I was part owner of the houseboat. There's like 10 of us that had shares. 
And a few of them were pissed because they're like, you're not even, you're like joking about it as you're driving everything else. And I grew up with a father that like, bless his heart, but like if anything went wrong, he lost his shit. Like, and I just remember he ruined half our family vacations. He ruined half the family outings. So I, as an adult, just said, I'm never going to be like that. Like, I'm going to be cool. Like if my kid gets in a wreck or my buddy, you know, I had a buddy one time, I had an Audi A7 when I was in college and my buddy took it. I was out of town. I was at my, I was at Disneyland with my girlfriend and my buddy, he ended up taking it. I left the keys there at the house and he wrecked it. And he called me at like midnight and he's like, bro, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like I took your car. I wrecked it. I hit something in the middle of the road. And I remember because I was a kid, I wrecked one time. I called my dad and he immediately just started yelling at me instead of, he didn't even ask if I was okay. And so I remember like in that moment, I'm like, man, are you okay? Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Was, was anyone else hurt? He's like, no. I was like, okay, well, thanks for calling me, man. Like, I'm glad you're okay. We'll call you tomorrow, you know? And he told me a few days later, he's like, bro, I sat there and stared at the phone for like 20 minutes. That was the <laughs> hardest conversation I've ever had in my life. And you were just like so cool about it. And I explained to him like, well, my dad used to make me, you know, like yell at me. And so I was like, I just never want to be that way. Mm-hmm. And so I don't even know where I was going with that story or whatever, but um, and so with the meat thing, so like when the houseboat was sinking, you know, that's one of the things like, I'm just I'm not going to get upset. Like, I'm just going to make this the best of it. And then, but then another time, so I was telling you the story with Herman. So I told you about the van that had like the cow's arms hanging out the window. Mm-hmm. So it was the only one, obviously it was our van, but the back door didn't lock. And I knew this. And so I was at like nine 30 at night. One time I was passing like an Albertson's grocery store mm-hmm. and I was with my, uh, my best buddy, Chris. He's a big dude. He's like 6'2", 275. I'm like, hey, let's play a prank on Herman. We, um, let's sneak in the back of the van. It'll be unlocked. And when he comes out from the groceries, he'll go to drive off. We'll like sit up or you sit up and scare him because he never met my friend. You know, I was like, yeah, this big goof. I'm going to scare the shit out of Herman. And by the way, Herman's 6'5 as well. This dude's huge. <laughs> And uh, probably 265. And uh, so Herman gets in and he starts driving away. And I tell Chris to sit up and he sits up and nothing. So I kind of give a <clears throat> and Herman like stops, you know, he's still in the parking lot. And he like turns around and he looks at Chris and he is just staring at him for like <laughs> five <laughs> seconds that felt like a hundred. Right. And I'm like, oh, shit, Herman's going to kill him. And so I finally I sit up and I'm like, Herman, Herman. And he's like, oh, hey, hey. I'm like, bro, how are you not scared by that? There's somebody in your car. And he goes, Jimmy, when things go wrong, people panic. He goes, you can't panic. You have to think, how do I get out of a situation? I was planning my escape. And I'm like, good <laughs> hell. Like, this is like some ninja stuff. And so I've just always thought of that. Like, anytime things go wrong, like, people panic, right? They make bad decisions. So, like, it's really important to try to slow things down in that moment and really focus on, like, all right, what do I actually need to do here? And so at the house, but I kind of did the same thing. I was like, all right, like... This thing is clearly sinking. <laughs> I'm in right. trouble. But I just kept going full throttle. And yeah, man. And uh, we ended up getting it back to uh, the dock. It paid a $6,000 deductible. And the ha- houseboat was back on the water, you know, the next year, I guess. But wow, crazy times. That, that is crazy. That whole story of, you know, not panicking, uh, you know, with Herman, that's really interesting. But Dude, I could have gone south real quick. <laughs> you imagine he like has to have some gun on him or something. Right. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that prank very often. <laughs> it was hilarious. He scared the shit out of us. We didn't scare him at all. Right. But, you know, I think that's an important lesson, especially in times right now where so many people are panicking. And you know what? That, that can be related to personal business. I mean, a lot of people are making decisions based out of fear or holding off decisions based out of fear. So how would you personally lean into that fear? Yeah, well, I think it's important to understand that like fear is going to be real. But what is fear actually like, you know, I've and I guess this is part of like experiencing life enough. But what I had this rule when I was a kid, like anytime I felt afraid to do something, I had to do it. I just did that. Like, I don't know who taught me that or I learned that. So I remember like even in high school and college, if I saw a pretty girl, I had three seconds to go talk to her. That was it. Because if you think about it too long, A, you start looking weak to the girl, but B, you just don't do it. It's like if you've ever gone cliff jumping, right? Like when you jump off the cliff, if you stand there too long, you're not going to go. So when you're standing there, you're just going to go, ah, whatever. You send it. And as a little kid, I was always doing those things. And so I learned the rewards that came on the other side of fear, right? Like we've heard this saying, everything you want in life is on the other side of fear. And it just is. And so it's not that I'm not afraid like of things like, oh, all right. But I kind of understand that like 98% of the things that happen to us or that we're afraid of in life mm-hmm. never actually happen. Um, there's a book 
called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. It's by Dale Carnegie, actually. He wrote mm-hmm. Think and Grow Rich. It's amazing. It's all about, um, you know, like we – when we let ourselves suffer from what we worry about – we experience the same emotions as if it was actually happening. So you've heard the saying, you die by a thousand deaths. Because what happens is if you're worried about these things happening, you feel the same. Like if you actually die by getting hit by a car, for example, it's going to be a pretty quick experience. Right. If you die jumping off the cliff, like, okay, like it's going to happen pretty damn fast. It's about five seconds till you're complot, you know. Um, if you get shot, it's like, okay, it was a couple 30 seconds and you're dead. Like the actual la- – the actuality of like the things that we're afraid of mm-hmm. – aren't really that bad. And, um, and when you can kind of change your mindset around what, what, you know, what to be afraid. So like for me, I trained myself, like I, I I literally have done these, (laughs) this is going to sound so stupid, but I've done these exercises where I'll plan my funeral. Okay. Like I've planned my funeral and then I literally write the talks of my best friend, my mom, my wife, my kid, um, all these, imaginary people like 30 years from now talking at my funeral and I say what they, I want them to say at my funeral. And then I talk about if I didn't like, if I had a shitty life, what they would say at my funeral. Mm -hmm. And I've done like spent hours and hours on these things. And what it helps you realize is like, I'm not afraid of trying stuff. I'm not afraid of going for it. I'm not afraid of, it's like my whole book talks about this. Um, you end up where you're heading the hidden dangers of living a safe life. That's the name of my book because I've understood that like the, People don't regret the things they do in life. They regret the things that they never did, the, mm-hmm. the, the the dreams that die within them. And so by doing that exercise, I got to see like, oh, my gosh, like if I go for it in life and like try all these amazing things and completely fail, people will be so proud of me. They're like, what an interesting guy. He just never gave a shit. He just kept trying. He just kept right. doing things. But when you never do anything, you're just boring. Like who wants to be boring? Like screw that. Like I'd rather be anything than boring. It's you know, like I never try to take the easy path. I, I just, I, I despise mediocrity. I really do. It's like, why would you ever want to be average at something or mediocre? If I'm playing any kind of game and I'm not that good at it, I have a hard time like getting into that game or I have to like really get good at it. Like for years, golf was just kind of like this thing that was kind of like, uh, it's fun to be on the course with my buddies, but like, I hate this game. I still got to, so this last year I started taking lessons. I got pretty good. And it's like all of a sudden I'm like, okay, now I'm addicted. Now I'm like buying the most expensive <laughs> clubs. I'm getting taking these lessons, like hundred dollar lessons a couple times a week. Like, let's go. Like I'm going to be a good golfer. And like, because I just don't want to be average at something. I don't want to suck at something. Like it's just in life in general, you know, like too many people are afraid of what could go wrong. Um, and I actually, a girl yesterday, my friend, she asked me to go to lunch and she's just been in a funk. And she has this business idea. It's an awesome business idea. Mm-hmm. Awesome business idea. It's going to work. And she could make 30 grand a month doing it. And she kept telling me about it. She's already bought some of the equipment for it. She's got her space to lease out. And she kept being like, ah, you think it'll work? It'll work. And she kept thinking of like saying like, well, if it doesn't work, at least this. Or like, I could worst case scenario, I could always do this. And I said, you keep thinking about everything that could go wrong. Right. I said, if you actually put any effort into thinking about what could go right, like, what could you do with $30,000 a month? What could you do for your two kids? What could what vacations could you go on? What dreams could you fulfill? And she's like, I just love talking to you. Like, I'm like, well, yeah, you're, you're still caught up in all these things that could go wrong. I said, all you need to start focusing on is everything that can go right. And when I said that to her, she's like, oh, my gosh, you're so right. I'm going to do it. And she's so excited. And I think, she, I mean, this girl's like got like one of the best situations I've ever seen for a single one. She's got a couple hundred grand in the bank. She's got a job that pays her regardless of this income and like all these different things. I'm like, girl. It's time to go for it. Like, right. let's go at this point. You just, and, but it helps, you know, people are so caught up and they're so used to their parents talking about what went wrong or they hear miserable adults talk about their lives and how everything, you know, you know and when I was a kid, I remember going to my friend's houses and if their parents were miserable, I couldn't go. I just hated being in that environment. And I grew up in a, I'd say a middle to lower class area. So there was a lot of adults that were kind of miserable adults. And I remember as a very little kid, being, I'm going to be a happy adult. Like people will be excited when I show up. People will smile when I walk in the room. Little kids will run to me. Like I want my <laughs> life to be an example of how to live an extraordinary life. And so all these things that I do and everything I've been trying to do, you know, my whole life, it truly is to just try to be an example. I just want to be a kind of person where people are like, yeah, like, I want to live like that guy. Like that guy's going for it right. and try to inspire people to go for their own dreams. Yeah, absolutely. It's that what if question that people put in their heads of, you know, what if it goes wrong, but reframe it? What if it goes right? What if all these things play to my advantage and really take off? I think that's really important for people who are 
you know, in a nine to five trying to get out of it, you know, that could be one really good benefit if you reframe that what if into what if it all went right. Yeah. Um, yeah, very right, man. Throughout the theme of your book, um, we're going to talk a little bit about your book here because at, at the end I want uh, to be able to give away uh, some copies of your book. But it really seems like you've just lived a bold life and, you know, you get to this point of you're kind of at the top of the real estate game, 2008 hits, nobody sees it coming, everything goes down and rather than, you know, just shrink and hide away, you stuck with it, you you picked up the phone, you kept making all those calls, all these things that people wouldn't be bold enough to do. They would just sit back and think, okay, well, what what went wrong? You know, how did I do this wrong? They just kind of think of, again, the, the bad side of the situation. So was that something that has always been ingrained in you in the just pick up the phone and keep going or... Man, I don't, I mean, the thing was, is like, there wasn't like there was, to me, there was no choice. It was crazy though. Like we had almost 200 agents in our office and, you know, when the market collapsed and you just saw them dropping like flies, like one after another, people just weren't there anymore. And, um, it was hard, man. I mean, I went in 2007, my income from 2007 to 2008 was about a third of what it was. Uh, I had days where I had to tell my assistant to hold his check. Like no shit. Like, I mean, it was, it was brutal, but, um, and I did look at other options myself. It was like, gosh, what else? You know, but at the end of the day, I wanted to do real estate. And it was um, as hard as it was. It just kind of was one of those things where I was like, well, I know I can work my way out of this. Like, I will have to work my way out of this. And uh, I don't know where that comes from. I remember when I was on my, uh, when I was I served my, my Mormon mission when I was 19 to 21. And I was in Monterey, Mexico. And you basically study for about two months, try to study the language and the religion and all that stuff. I go down to Mexico, and my first day, my com- my companion dude does not speak a lick of English, not one word. Like the dude, the only English he spoke is he tried to sing the song Barbie Girl. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was uh, – and I remember my second day, we had these interviews with the president. He's like your one friend, the American, you know, and he was like a drill sergeant dude. And I went in there. I talk about this in the book, but I went in. It was just such a defining moment in my life. And I remember I go in. And he says, well, how are you doing, Elder? You know, it's been, that was what they called us as missionaries. And it's been like two days. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be honest, not very good. You know, like I don't speak any Spanish, clearly. These, he doesn't speak any English. Like, don't know what the hell's going on. And he slams his desk and he yells at me. This is like, this is supposed to be like this spiritual, you know, loving human. He goes, damn it, Elder Rex. I don't want any sissies in my mission. You don't feel good? I don't, I don't care. He's like, if you don't feel good, go to work. If you got problems, if you're homesick, you know how you get rid of it? You go work. He goes, and he just yelled at me. Everything he kept saying is, you go to work. And I literally looked back at him and I go, well, I guess I'm going to work. <laughs> and, and I walked out of there. I was like, I literally was like, I got one option. I'm going to work. And I did. I just worked. And he was right. Like, it healed all the problems. And I ended up loving the entire two years, you know. And, I mean, it took me a few months to learn the language still and everything else. But, like, it was, uh, I truly learned that you can work your way out of any bad situation. And, uh, and so that's what I did. And yeah, man, so I don't know if it came from that or what. I When I was a kid, I had an experience, I'll tell real quick, when I was, so I, growing up, I was like a diehard baseball kid, like everything was baseball. And uh, I remember when I was 14 years old, well, when I was 12, I moved from Taylorsville, which was like the top baseball place in Utah, to Murray which is also pretty good. And I'd always been an all-star and always been one of the better kids. And when I moved to Murray, um, my I was 14 years old. And the year before, I'd been on the all-star team with all my buddies and everything. But when I was 14, um, I didn't play very good. We went to a bigger field, uh, and I was tiny. I was like weighed like less than 100 pounds. I just didn't do very good. But I, in my mind, I was a good baseball player. Like I'd always been an all-star. And I remember at the end of the year, we have this ceremony and it's like everybody goes to this amphitheater and, and they give the awards, the trophies for like first place in the league, second place. And then you give the all-star teams. And I was sitting there with all my buddies in like the second row. It's like 15 of us. I'll never forget it, dude. Uh, and I'm sitting there and they start calling. And by the way, everyone's parents are there. Everyone's grandparents are there. I mean, this is a big deal, you know. And they start calling up every kid to come out onto the field from the amphitheater like the sec the fan section mm-hmm. and to get their trophy and get in line get their all-star hat and everything and i'm sitting there and they start calling them up one by one 
And all of a sudden, I look down the line. There's like five trophies left. And there's like six of us. And all five of the kids sit next to me are like some of the best players. I'm like, oh, no. And it hit me. I'm like, oh, I didn't make the team. And one by one, dude, they call up these other kids until I am the only one sitting there. I'm 14 years old. It's like the most impressionable age you can have. I'm sitting there by myself. And all my friends are out on the field. And it's hit me. Like, you're going to spend the whole summer by yourself. They're going to be playing baseball all day, going on vacations together, doing all these things. And I was just alone. And I was sitting there. And I could feel the, like, shame of, like, you know, like, oh, man. I could feel the parents, like, oh, Jimmy's sitting there by himself. Like, my parents, I can only imagine my dad was going to yell at me or whatever. And I just start bawling, dude. This is a little 14-year-old kid. I was just sad. But I remember, like, in that moment, I can still get emotional thinking about it. But I literally, like, it was the worst I'd ever felt in my life. To this day, it's the worst I've ever felt in my life. I remember sitting there as a 14-year-old, and I said, I didn't work hard enough. Mm-hmm. I knew it in that moment. I said, you didn't deserve this. You didn't work hard enough. And I said, I will never, ever be outworked again. I will never feel like this because I didn't give enough effort. And that day... Jimmy Rex became an achiever and I used that fuel to push me for the next 25 years. And it was that feeling of like, I just never want to feel like this again. And so it was kind of cool. I started doing some plant medicine about two years ago and released this, like not being enough, you know, that had come to me and like pushed me to this place. It was like, I got the message, like this has served you and now it's time to let it go. So I'm like more at peace with everything now, but it really drove me. I just never wanted to be left out again. I never wanted, I mean, I got the message loud and clear, like you didn't work hard enough. And so you weren't able to hang out with your friends. You weren't lovable enough. You weren't enough. Like that's a strong message to get at 14 years old. And so it kind of really pushed me. And so when you say like, where does the work ethic come from? And I told that story in a while, but um, I guess you could say that's probably where it came from. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. I think, though, even though that work ethic is so strong, it may have been around this time that you said a couple of years ago where you were able to release that, but uh, you kind of live the lifestyle that I think every aspiring entrepreneur wants. They want to be able to do the work, make the money, and then live their life. And that's definitely something you exemplify of being able to still travel still have fun, pick up rental properties, you know, do all the things that everybody aspires to. So it was it was it that point, like you said, about two years ago where that mindset switched or were you always trying to? No, kind of- like part of doing all that other stuff, I mean, like I just was, I always said, like, I've always really focused, like, on taking care of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a firm believer that if I can show up at my best, then I'm going to be able to help a lot of other people. And if I'm not feeling good or not doing good, I saw this with other people. Like you can't help anybody when you're miserable, right? Like nobody's inspired by the miserable guy complaining about his job. And so I always was just like, I'm just going to live this life. And I just made a conscious decision. I had some really good mentors that taught me like, hey, you know, don't just work to live. Like really set yourself up, like live now like you've never have so that you can live later like no one else, right? Like that's one of the things my mentor, something along those lines would always say. And I remember just like just wanting to do cool things and I just did it. So like when opportunities presented themselves, I would go or I would just present my own opportunities. And the one thing I did that was really worked out well was I picked a career real estate agent where my job is to know as many people as possible. So a lot of the cool, fun stuff I've been able to do, it kind of helped advance my career as well. And so like all the vacations and trips I went on, I always went with people and there's a special bond that's formed when you travel together. It's just a different kind of thing, right? And I would throw all these parties because I just loved throwing parties. I remember when I was a kid, same thing, like we were pretty poor growing up. Like we didn't, I didn't have one party at my house growing up as a kid, like until maybe like barely at the end of my senior year of high school or something. But I remember like my rich buddies would throw the parties and I remember all the girls just wanted to be around the guy throwing the party. Mm -hmm. And I was smart enough to see this. I'm like, well, shit, like when I get money, I'm going to throw some parties, you know? <laughs> so when I started hawking meat door to door, and I was making a thousand bucks a day going to college. Like I had more money than all my friends. And I just would throw these cool parties and uh, always end up with two or three girls in the night hanging around and you end up going out with them or making out with them or whatever, you know, it was, had some nice perks. And I realized, all right, this is a good thing. And then I'd get all my sales guys from throwing the same parties because we'd serve steak and chicken. So we had this whole clan of people that would just, you know, once every two weeks, we'd throw a barbecue and serve chicken. And I'd get three new sales guys out of it. And it was a perfect way to, I had this, I always had these little theories. So funny with dating, but I had one that was like, if you just go ask a girl out, you're coming from a huge disadvantage. 
But if she can see you in like an excellent atmosphere where you're like thriving and then you ask her out, then you're going to be like golden. And so instead of going up and, you know, when I was in college, like 21, 22, instead of just asking a girl out, I'd be like, hey, we're throwing a barbecue on, you know, Tuesday. You should come. And anytime me or one of my close buddies had a, a girl we had a crush on, we'd throw one of these barbecue parties. So it was about every two weeks. And, uh, you know, her and her friends would show up and we had this really attractive looking group of 50 to 75 people that was there eating steak and salmon and chicken. And the, it worked every time. It was worked like a charm. It was hilarious. But, um, but I kind of realized, you know, the host gets the most. And so I started making it a part. It was always kind of a part of, call it my business plan or my life plan, um, where I would just throw a lot of parties and I can't half ass anything. So when I throw a party, it's the best party. And like people just come from wherever and then they hear about my parties and they want to be a part of it. Like I always say, when I coach other real estate agents, I said, if you ever do an event and people come to do you a favor, then you've screwed it up. You want people pissed, like upset, like how come I wasn't invited if they weren't there? And so all the parties I throw, I just overdo it. Like anything worth doing is worth overdoing, you know, like yeah. mediocrity is for, for cowards. That whole thing, that's me to a T, dude. So every party I throw, I've gone big. And because of that, it's just opened a lot of doors. I've been able to meet amazing people and, and connect and be friends with a lot of, you know, really amazing humans that are like-minded that are also living life on the edge and doing these cool things. And so I would say I almost backed into the way I've been able to live by accident, okay. but I did make a conscious decision. You know, that I, when I was building my real estate business, I went seven years without leaving the country. And what had happened is I was dating this girl and she was all sad that I'd been to like six countries. And I remember thinking like, well, I don't want to, you know, I'll wait till I'm married then to travel for it. And, and meanwhile, I was building my business. I didn't have time or money to leave anyway. But then I had a buddy uh, named Eric Hill. Uh, a lot of people probably know who that is, but he was on The the Bachelorette. Mm -hmm. And this guy had a goal to go to – he'd be the quickest person to go to every country in the world. It was called Eric's Global Odyssey. And uh, he actually died after about six months. He'd been to 50-something countries, and he hit a mountain uh, doing a speed glide and died. Mm -hmm. And it was a wake-up goes. This was in 2000. Um, 14, 2014, spring of 2014, April, 2014. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm done waiting. Like I'm going to go yeah. live my life. And so I, we had this hashtag live like Eric. It was so admirable. This dude just l literally did whatever he wanted. And so from that day on, I just said, I don't have time to travel. I don't have money to travel, but I'm going to, because it's now the priority. I don't have time to do these things or money to do these things, but I'm going to do them anyway, because that's how I want to live. I could die tomorrow. I could literally be taken out tomorrow and I'm going to live my life the way Eric did. He really inspired me. And so from that day forward, I started traveling. And since then, since that April, 2014, I've been to over 70 countries, wow. um, literally been all over the world doing the most amazing things you can do with some of the most amazing humans alive and created this life that, um, that I kind of always wanted. It was kind of cool. I gave myself permission. Like, you know, I, I just gave myself permission. I just said, I'm going to do these things. I'm, this is going to be a part of who I am. And I still do. So like coronavirus happened last year and I just kept going. I just kept doing stuff. You know, I went to a couple of different countries, went to Turks and Caicos, went to um, Belize, went to Mexico a few times. Um, you know, do what you can. But I'm just I, I don't live in fear, man. I don't like I'm just I'm out here doing the thing. And, you know, I teach people when I'm coaching them, I say, look, if you walk up to a fire, eventually you're going to get burned. Like eventually you get too close to the fire or you're in the fire. But if you run through a fire you don't get burnt. You don't even feel it. Like, right. and so like, just keep running, man, just keep moving, move fast enough that, um, and then take time to slow down, spend it with yourself, fall in love with yourself. That's what I've been doing the last year and a half is really that whole idea. So like when you run, run hard. And then when you rest or relax, like really spend that time falling in love with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You, one of your most bold trips, I think that, uh, at least I know of is, uh, going to the world series, and without a ticket, and <laughs> it was game six of uh, when the Boston Red Sox won, if I'm correct. And you managed to get yourself on the field and be a part of the trophy ceremony and all this stuff. Like, Yeah, the whole thing, man. <laughs> that was just – and that was literally just going for – like, it's shocking what you can get away with if you just go for it in life. Like, in that event, like – I didn't have a ticket. It was game four. It was against the Cardinals. Um, I'd gone to game seven of the Yankees Red Sox right. as part of the same trip. But game four, it was the Red Sox Cardinals. And yeah, we just, we ended up finding a guy that snuck us into the stadium for the game. And, uh, and then I ended up sneaking onto the field. It was crazy. And next thing I know, I'm like, I mean, I, I was at my house a week before sitting there watching game six, the bloody sock with Kurt Schilling. And, uh, I just was like, wait, I, how much is a ticket to New York? I could go to this game. Like, I just kind of had the thought, like, wait, I should just go for it. And I was like 20, I was 23, 
Um, I was pretty young, you know, and it was just funny though. I just was like, why not? Like, I'm going to go try to make this happen. And I mean, if you knew how many things went wrong on that trip that like I had to work my way through, like we bought scalped tickets that were fake to the original game and like we got so lucky, but like all these things happen and there's just the universe conspires in your favor when you go for it. And we ended up getting on the field. Yeah, man, I got all this dirt and balls from this was when the Red Sox broke the curse of the Bambino. And I'm just sitting there on the field, just loving life, taking photos and the whole thing. It was a once in a billion opportunity. And just one of those things that just happened because I just made it happen. Like people just you can make a lot of shit happen in life if you just go for it. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I love that story. One thing I wanted to talk to you about also is, uh, you know, you talked about throwing parties for networking and that really helped to expand your network. So let's say I, I definitely believe in the power of networking and what it brings to your business. How would somebody who maybe doesn't have the ability, especially in this time to throw big house parties, how would you suggest they go about networking? Yeah. I mean, it's getting creative, right? Um, so like we, I mean, not everybody's going to be able to throw a giant party, but you can start throwing events to get together. So one of my closest friends is a good buddy of mine named Dan Fleischman. And this dude kind of runs the show in L.A. Um, if you ever seen Molly's Game, the movie about poker and all that, she used to work for Dan and his buddy Gamble. And so they were like the ones that originally set this up. Well, he moved to L.A. and didn't know anybody. So he just started hosting poker nights. And the dude started hosting poker night a couple times a week. Next thing you knew, this guy had the who's who of L.A. come into his poker parties and he kind of became the dude in L.A. And now, like, I just was looking at his Instagram yesterday. He was hanging out with Mike Tyson, right. um, the who's who. I mean, the guy's yeah. friends with everybody. Like, it's hilarious. But And that's how he started. Um, for me, like, I don't know, a simple one was, like, this $100 dinner club that I'm doing right now, right? Like, um, I just said, well, this would be a really cool way to meet like-minded people that are, like, a, of service. Like, they, they love doing charity work. So we just once a week get together and have a dinner. Everybody has to pay 100 bucks to be there. And we give all the money as a tip to the waitress at the end. Like, it's freaking cool. And it's just a right. cool little thing. You don't have to be the most networked guy in the world or, you know, throw these massive parties. You just have to be creative a little bit. Like, find an opportunity in your area um, and just do cool stuff. You know, I remember when, like, those meat parties I used to throw. Like, honestly, those barbecues were golden, man. I knew everybody in town. Like, I remember when I moved to Provo. Um, I'd been engaged in 2010. I broke it off. I didn't know anybody. And so I was like, all right, I want to get social quick. Mm -hmm. So I bought a boat and every couple, three, four times a week, man, I'd call up my buddies and say, Hey, let's find some new girls, find some new guys. And we just we went boating every day. You spend three, four hours on a boat with somebody, you get to know them. And within four months, I remember I met somebody four months later towards, that was the beginning of the summer I bought it. At the end of the summer, um, I mean, we'd been boating gosh, 70 times probably. Mm -hmm. And I ran into somebody. They're like, oh, you're Jimmy Rex. Like, dude, you've been in Provo forever. Like, you know everybody. And I'm like, bro, I got here four months ago. <laughs> and it was just funny, right? Like this dude assumed that I just had been in this town forever or whatever. But at the time, I'd literally only been back in Provo for four months. And it was because we were going out of our way to create value is the best way I can put it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like everybody needs something. Find out what that is. And if you create enough value, people are going to want to come around. And so no matter who you're trying to network with, you got to create value and come from that service standpoint and you'll find yourself around a lot of cool people. Yeah, absolutely. I was fortunate enough to come to your first hundred dollar dinner and it was interesting. I sat next to somebody and I kept thinking uh, through my head. I'm like, this, this guy sounds familiar. I can't quite pinpoint it. And it was Hasim Sakar mm. who you actually talk about in your book and it clicked after the dinner is like, <laughs> there it is. Now, awesome. now I get it. So, yeah, great, great person, great uh, thing that you're doing. And you know what? You're really giving back to the local restaurants. And one thing that you've pivoted towards, I think, is really showing the philanthropic side of what you're doing. Obviously, you're doing these $100 dinners. You're a big part of Operation Underground Railroad, which is a great organization. And here's the thing is, like, again, it's just it's more about a way of being, right? Like, Business, Zig Ziglar says, it's an old quote, and you've heard it a million times, but it's so damn true. I just want to say it again. But if the way to get everything you want in this life is to help enough other people get what they want. That's just the bottom line. And so, like, I love being around the kind of people that do, that, you know, that do charity work. Like, um, every person that came to that dinner has a good heart. I know it. Like, they're good people. They want to be a part of something, right? Um, when I started working with, uh, you know, some of these child rescue uh, organizations like OUR and CLF and these other companies, 
um, these other charities, you know, I started meeting some of the most amazing humans, the biggest hearts, people like Jeremy Nevis and um, Andy McCubbins and Paul Hutchinson. And um, these, to this day, are some of my best friends in the world now, right? Uh, or, you know, just doing cool things like, um, and then you just, so I think it goes together. It's not, you don't do it. You don't do the service things with the intent of like building your business, but it's just the way life works. Like when you're giving, 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 like when you put positive vibrations out into the world, that's what's going to find you back. Um, we live in a world, man, where you can find evidence of whatever you want. If right. you want to look for evidence of things that are going wrong, it's not hard to find. Yeah. But if you want to look for evidence of things going right, it's not hard to find. Right. And so kind of my philosophy is I'm just going to do as many good things as I can um, that puts me in situations and around people that I know are going to be like-minded that way. And it seems to just work every time, man. And I just keep meeting amazing people, people like yourself that are just good people. And, um, that's who I want to spend my time around. That's who I want to spend my time with. And so it's cool to, you know, again, you do those things and you quickly find out, you know, uh, that there's more reward in doing that than anything else you can do. Like I can't, I don't understand people that have all the money in the world and they just keep it for themselves. Like I overpay my employees and the people around me. Like I give a lot of money, but it's like, I couldn't buy with that money, the experience of seeing my friend be able to, you know, give this to his kids or be able to be to spend the time with their families and like be able to do these other things or be able to experience like we did last week with, you know, that watching that young girl cry and that girl's had a tough go, man. I didn't even know this at the time. I mean, she had a kid a few years ago and she was in high school and she kept it and she, you know, that kid's been struggling and he, he's deaf and needed some ear wow. replacement things. And, um, she just had to come out of pocket for it with money she didn't have. And here we show up with like 3000 bucks at her door, you know, and wow. that's why she got so emotional and, and just little cool things like that. Like what else would we possibly buy for a hundred dollars that would have given us the experience of that? Nothing. Right. And I think people just forget that, you know, like we start getting in our own world. Life gets a little tough and we start, you know, crunching up on what we're willing to do. But every single time I've given, every single time I've opened up my checkbook or my time and effort to help other people, I've always been glad I did it. Mm -hmm. And there's something to that, man. And so it's easy to do. And it's whether it's a part of my business or it's not, it's just a way of being. And that in and of itself brings you experiences in life and benefits and everything else. Yeah, that's awesome. No, I love that attitude and that philosophy of just giving and that absolutely does come back full circle to you well i don't want to take too much of your time we've i've already gone over the time we we talked about so last question i want to ask you before you we have an opportunity to find out more about where to follow you um personal or business what is it that excites you about the future I'm excited about the future just because it's unknown, man. There's so many things to do still. I'm such a curious human. I just love to experience everything. So I have so many ideas, so many places I want to go, things I want to do, people I want to meet. Um, you know, I'm excited every day to just help people. And, the, you know, I had. I wish, I really wish that, like, I had an uncle or a, a mentor like myself when I was younger. I, I, I just made so many mistakes on my own. And so I love to do that for other people, to be that mentor, to be able to share my information, my knowledge and the mistakes I've made in business and life and everything else. And so hopefully I can inspire some people. And, um, you know, it's fun, man. I just I love life. I, I really enjoy being around people and sharing life, sharing experiences. And so I'm excited about it all. Yeah, that's awesome. So where is it that best people can best connect with you? Yeah, like everything I do, I um, share through my Instagram story. So whether I'm like my book, my new videos I come out with, um, new podcasts I'm doing, um, blog articles, whatever I'm doing, my travels, everything else I share through my Instagram. So the best thing to do is follow me there, which is Mr. Jimmy Rex. Um, you just type in Jimmy Rex and I come up. Um, but yeah, if you want to follow me there, keep an eye on what I'm doing. If you ever have questions, feel free to reach out to anybody. And, um, I'm pretty good. I think at getting back to people, I always try to reach out and, uh, cause I think it's cool when, you know, I reach out and people get back to me. So anything I can do to help with anybody, man, don't be afraid to reach out. Well, I appreciate that. So, uh, one thing I want to, uh, mention real quick before we end though, is he's or giving away 10 copies of Jimmy's book. You end up where you're heading and, uh, you, or an author of two books, but this is your more recent one. Really love it. I think it really relates to everybody 
uh, not just business related, but your own personal life. And so uh, make sure to check out uh, Instagram after this goes live. The details will be there, but it, you have to make sure to be following Jimmy as part of that. So I know I've gotten a ton of value out of this. So I know my audience has gotten value out of this. So I encourage you all to get out there and hustle the day. Hey everybody, thank you for watching this video all the way through here on YouTube. One thing that would help us out tremendously to share this value with more people is if you subscribe to the channel, like the video, make a comment, share it with others, click that bell notification to say, hey, I wanna see more videos like this. That would tremendously help us out and I would sincerely appreciate it if you did that. Thank you again for watching this video.